today we are in for a treat. We have Amy Merrill and Zach Talbot joining us to discuss the harms done by the overregulation of certain medications people need as a matter of essential health and well being. I want to start off by giving a brief introduction to, uh, for our speakers and highlight their organizations. First up, we have Amy Merrill. Amy is the Digital Director of Plan C, a campaign to spotlight the over-medicalization and restriction of abortion pills and counter the politics and stigma that have crippled access to information on self-managed care. Plan C shares information on the pills, including what they are and how people access them, does research, and lays the groundwork for better access to the safe, effective method in the US, particularly for underserved po uh, populations who would be especially benefited by the abortion pills affordability and convenience. And Zach is the president of National Alliance for Medication Assisted Recovery. Um, it's an organization of medication assisted treatment, MAP patients, uh, healthcare professionals, friends and associates working together for greater public understanding and acceptance of MAT. National Alliance for Medication Assisted Recovery works to correct the misconception about methadone and buprenorphine treatment and overcome the prejudice directed against patients and medications to treat opioid addiction. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Uh, a quick introduction of myself. My name is Kendall Benson and I'm the organizer at the National Advocates for Pregnant Women. NAPW uses legal advocacy, public education and organizing to ensure that no one is arrested or detained, shamed or denied their constitutional or human rights because they have the capacity for pregnancy, are pregnant, or because of any outcome of pregnancy, including abortion, miscarriage, stillbirth, and birth. Uh, NAPW seeks to ensure that substance use disorders and other health and welfare problems people face during pregnancy are addressed as health issues, not as crimes, and that pregnant and parenting people have access to full range of reproductive health care, as well as access to confidential voluntary drug treatment services. While many people view the war on abortion and the war on drugs as being distinct, there are in fact many connections and overlaps between the two. Their history, the, uh, the strategies used to control and punish some reproductive choices and those to control the use of certain drugs, the limitations that exist to access to reproductive health care and drug treatment and the populations most harmed by those limita uh, limitations are remarkably similar. These similarities are particularly apparent when the issues intersect in the regulation and punishment of pregnant people who use drugs. As an organization concerned about fundamental issues of social justice, it is so important to take advantage of opportunities like this webinar to discuss the similarities among and relationships between these issues so that we can work to build coalitions and build strength and power in fighting to ensure civil and human rights. Today, Amy and Zach will be discussing the importance of access to medications for, self, self, uh, for safe self-managed abortions, as well as medication-assisted treatment, or MAT treatment, for substance use disorders. While COVID-19 has certainly highlighted the harms done by overregulations of these medications that people need as a matter of essential health, and I say essential very purposefully, uh, one thing our speakers will make clear is that this is not a new need that has appeared with the onset of the pandemic. And it is certainly an issue that will be around uh, long after it subsides, unless activists can rally together and achieve real meaningful change. I'm about to hand it over to Amy and Zach, but before I do, I want to thank NAPW student organizers. They are working hard to shape NAPW student series, which we hope you all continue to enjoy. So we want to use this time uh, to be as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions, please post it in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Please keep in mind the Q&A section is different from the chat section where you all just introduce yourself. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, you also have the opportunity to give a thumbs up to the people's questions that you wanna hear the answers to. Uh, and by doing that, you'll be able to help us decide which questions to answer during this webinar. We're gonna have a lot of time for questions. So if one pops into your head, go ahead and sit it out there. Uh, I'll be filling the questions and posing them to Amy and Zach. So if you're just now joining us again, please feel free to use the chat box, introduce yourself and let us know where you're tuning in from. And with all that said, I think we are ready to get started. Amy, what do we need to know? Great, thank you so much for that introduction, Kendall, and for having me today. It's a real honor to be a part of this conversation and to meet all of your amazing community members and organizers. Um, it's very exciting. 
And I'd like to start with actually an animated video that we made last at the end of last year before all of this uh, all of this began with COVID. And so I'm just going to share. Oops. Our country is in a choice. Um, can you tell me? Are you seeing my screen? Yes, Let me go. yes, great. And you're hearing my audio from the video? Yeah. A little blip that just played? Perfect. Okay, so it's about a minute and a half long. Let's sit back and just uh, take this in first. Our country is in a choice crisis with an administration that's closing clinics, punishing providers, and effectively demanding people carry unwanted pregnancies to term. We need an option for a safe, self-managed at-home abortion, a plan C. And this solution exists, so why doesn't everyone know about it? Let's review. 30 years ago, a combination of pills was discovered to effectively end an early pregnancy. The health community celebrated. The world would be forever changed. The French Minister of Health even declared them the moral property of women. But when the pills came to the U.S., they were severely restricted by the FDA. Not for medical or safety reasons, but because of politics. Today, they're used by millions worldwide every year and backed by mountains of data on safety and efficacy. While in the U.S., they're still held from us by the FDA, over-medicalized, even kept out of pharmacies. But this is changing. Abortion pills and information on how to use them can now be found on the internet via online pharmacies, human rights organizations, and a physician-supported site called Aid Access. All of us can play a part in bringing this option into the mainstream. One, demand the FDA remove the restrictions on abortion pills. Two, spread the word. Tell everyone you know that abortion pills and information on how to use them are available online. Three, know your rights and risks. Free legal support is always available. The solution is here. Learn more at plancpills.org. All right. So that's a little back history for you. And now Kendall is going to share a quick poll just to get a sense of where everyone's at. No pressure. This is just um, to see uh, how much information, what, what kinds of information you might have on abortion pills or a little bit of a snapshot. So if you all, can you, can everyone see the poll? Did it pop up? Oh, perfect. Okay. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. it's coming in. And if you were watching the animation, you'd get a little hint on that first one, perhaps. <laughs> and again, if you have any specific questions that maybe that animation also popped into your head, please drop that into the Q&A so that Amy can address those specific questions. Okay, Amy, can you see on your end the results? I don't see the results. Well, let me tell you what we've got. If you are right. actually, um, or actually, do you just want to keep on going on and then address those later? Sure, sure. We'll get a little more um, information under our belt first. Perfect. Okay, great. So, um, Hopefully that was um, an entry, it's, it, uh, either that animation was brand new information for you or perhaps you know a bit because of all the work that you've been doing on this issue area, on the story of abortion pills. Um, a few more clarifying points about abortion pills. As you saw in the video, they are a combination of two medications. Um, one of them, misoprostol, is about 85 to 90% effective on its own. The other, mifepristone, um, allows it in combination to be up to 98% effective. And it's um, approved for use within the first 10 weeks of pregnancy. And it's different from Plan B. Uh, you probably have heard of Plan B, also called the morning after pill, 
one of the founders of Plan C was on the team to bring that over the counter 20 plus years ago um, after it was going to be prescription only, which as you can imagine, it kind of defeats the purpose of it being emergency contraception. So um, Plan C is abortion pills able to be taken within the next 10 weeks. In other countries, they're sometimes even called a missed period pill or a bring back my period pill, which gives you also a little bit of the snapshot of the cultural differences that we see around the world in talking about abortion and, um, and reframing it uh, as we continue to navigate the politics of this particular issue area here in the US. So um, Plan C is about four years old as a campaign, and we've seen so much change even in the last four years. Um, we really started out being the only ones on the internet talking about online abortion pills. Um, we created a report card based on research of online pharmacies and started to rate, evaluate, share information on what was out there in terms of where people were able to access abortion pills to order online. And um, since then, we've seen dozens and dozens of online pharmacies pop up. And we've also, in the time of COVID, which we'll talk about in just a minute, we've seen a changing narrative around uh, access to abortion pills and more and more people stepping forward to demand access and to figure out what needs to change in order for people to be able to use them. This is all based on really solid safety and efficacy information. We usually share that um, Statistically speaking, abortion pills are safer than Viagra and Tylenol. And so if you compare that to the restrictions that you saw in the animation, those restrictions are really serious. Um, the question about pharmacies, so to, to tap into that first poll question, is Mifepristone available in pharmacies in the US? The answer is no. And um, that means that it's limited to being able to access it only from doctors or providers of abortion services or clinics. And that's very different than most drugs. Um, if you think about that, the fact that you can't go to a pharmacy to pick it up, that changes the game. It changes where people can access abortion, period, where and how. Um, another uh, reality of abortion pills that we've um, learned over the years is that the pricing of abortion pills is unfortunately not matching what this pill costs over the counter. These, it's actually a combination of five pills, as you saw in the video. But the, the price of what's called an abortion kit um, in another country or online, which is this combination of pills in a package, um, that can be something like 6 to $10 over the counter in a country like India, where the pills are often produced. And here in the States, you'll see in a clinic an abortion, a, a medication abortion is priced at Six hundred to eight hundred dollars without insurance, and um, my understanding of why is that as this started to become a more common practice in the um, you know, fifteen plus years ago, they wanted to price it at a comparable price point to the surgical or aspiration abortion, so that it wasn't a decision based on price that someone was making a decision based on what they wanted. Unfortunately, where that's brought us today is that this is an incredibly expensive method. Um, Oftentimes for no reason, especially if someone's um, looking for the pills online. So as you can see, it's a it's a changing landscape. Um, it's really common all around the world. We're living in a time of so much self care and more and more acceptance of telemedicine. And um, so the the irony becomes deeper that these pills that are now proven over and over again for their safety and efficacy are still just not easily available in the U.S. And I'll touch on that second poll question now. Um, what percentage of the U.S.'s abortions per year are with abortion pills? The answer is 40 percent. It's actually 43 percent, right? right in that range, um, which is surprising to a lot of people because if you've never really heard about abortion pills or maybe you've heard of them but didn't know really what they were or how they worked, that's a big percentage of abortions that are happening with abortion pills. And and what's typically happening is that those pills are being handed over in the clinic and the person is sent home to take them on their own. So when we look at that as researchers and also activists, we look at that and say, hmm, that already looks pretty self-managed. Um, it's a provider offering consult and answering questions and being a resource and the actual process of the abortion is happening at home. Um, and the final point that I like to share is that um, it's, 
uh, it's, it's just been a circumstance of over-medicalizing. And even doctors and providers who are pro-choice and who do want to be helping people in any way they possibly can often still think that this is something that needs to be ha happening from the hands of a doctor to the patient because that's just been the training they received. So we're living in a moment where we have an opportunity to examine this situation and decide whether it still fits. And that is even more so in the time of COVID. So, um, as you know, so much is changing. A lot has changed in just the, the landscape of online access to pills. There's an organization called Aid Access that, um, if you're curious, you should learn more about. It's a doctor named Rebecca Gompertz, based in Europe, who um, had a film made about her about 10 years ago called Vessel, where she was sailing a ship in waters off of countries that prohibited abortion. She was offering abortions in um, international waters. Um, basically as a service and also as a statement of kind of the arbitrary nature of these things. And um, she has been shipping for the last year or so from Europe to the States and serving thousands upon thousands of people in the US with abortion pills. In the time of COVID, the airports have started to close down. And so the airport in India where her packages were being shipped from is currently closed. You can see that on her website. And so suddenly people who were going to rely on aid access, which is already a situation you have to stop and think about that in the US, so many states, so many people in so many states are relying on an overseas shipment in order to get the health care that they need. So in this time of COVID, we're actually seeing shifts in the medical community that are ultimately really positive. We're seeing more access to telemedicine. We're seeing a new protocol being pushed forward by the medical community around abortion specifically that's being called a no test protocol. It's acknowledging that um, the ultrasound and blood tests that are sometimes required for people to get abortion pills are not medically necessary. Um, and so, the, and then the, the attorneys general in California and along with 21 other states actually just sent a letter to the FDA asking for a waiving of the restrictions on the system. So these are big shifts. These are things that we've been talking about for years that we've been exploring with professional, with medical professionals, with lawyers, with all the experts for years, just trying to figure out why we're still in this situation and what needs to shift and in COVID, the silver lining of this whole experience and all of the challenge and, and struggle that comes with it is that a scenario is developing where abortion pills would actually be set up to be offered in the online provision model that we've seen be so successful with doctors like Rebecca Gompertz and um, a, a few telemedicine studies previous to this here in the U.S. So I put here at the bottom, COVID is really an opportunity to address structural inequities that hold women back and allow us to reimagine and transform systems to better support their choices and their lives. And you see on the right, we're actually um, just trying to gather information right now with uh, doctors and clinicians and lawyers and public health experts just to try to assess the landscape and figure out what needs to happen next in order for doctors to serve people who are in need of an early abortion under the time of COVID and are in lockdown because their options have suddenly become that much more limited. So uh, this is just a, a recap of our campaign. We don't sell pills. That's another question that gets asked and Plan C is not a pill provider. We are a communications campaign and a research project. We're under the parent organization of the National Women's Health um, organization and they're our fiscal sponsor and so we're able to do all this work as researchers and advocates and and really uh, work on these different channels these different opportunities to push forward toward the vision of what we see in the near future and it's really a vision that I love sharing with college students and recent grads because it's your future you know it's it's my future but it's probably even more so your future, I'm 37. And um, this is really happening. It really is changing. And if things can change under COVID, I'm doubtful that people will wanna go back to an old model where they have to drive 600 miles to a clinic. Um, granted, certain states are way more challenging than others. And you probably are watching the, the distinct nature of, you know, right now there's, there's 18 states that are just outlawing telemedicine for abortion period. And so, that's a very real barrier. And we're seeing so many shifts in other states that are going to offer a model. They're going to provide a demonstration. Um, and 
that's that's forward movement that we haven't experienced until now. So at Plan C, um, what we really encourage people to do right now, it's four simple things. It's spread the word. I don't know about you, but it really is a thing that many people don't even know about. They don't know the first thing about. And so the more people can just get the word out. We have tons of content. We have tons of Instagram posts you can repost. We have a lot on our website. Um, tell everyone you know. That abortion pills are available online, but they are safe and effective. Um, and go through our website to learn all you need to know about what people need to know, including number two, know your rights. Um, and I, I get this question a lot as well. For now, our right to choose is protected by the US Constitution and by Roe v. Wade. And states are passing all these restrictions to limit access and punish providers and women. And so it's really important that we keep on top of this and we understand the landscape. While these laws in the states might be unconstitutional, they still exist and we never want to put someone in harm's way. And so it's a constant um, information gathering. And, and really, it's if someone's going to make this decision anyway, they're going online to try to make this decision to try to self-manage abortion. We're always just trying to get them as much information as possible of what the facts are and what they need to know. Number three is sign a petition. So there are also a couple of really positive um, petitions happening right now, including our parent organization, Nat National Women's Health Network, and another one by an uh, organization called Care2, I'm going to bring up on the screen. And they're both just um, outright saying the FDA needs to lift these restrictions. It's time. They are not medically based. They are not medically sound. They are politics. They are a way to control abortion access and limit it to clinics and providers so that there is a more singular channel of access to abortion, which inherently holds people back, especially people who are already disadvantaged. So these petitions are pushing against the FDA, which is really important. It's a it's a longer game, but it's critical. And our program, the Ambassadors of Information program at Plan C is um, relatively new and it's really exciting. We're basically working with a smaller group of people to get them trained on the critical information so that they can start to speak up and potentially do tabling, hand out flyers, be real advocates for change. And of course, as you've already seen, it requires a little more of a deep dive into the lay of the land, the history, the facts, everything someone would need to know to truly speak out. Um, so there's more information about that on our website as well, and I'm happy to always connect with people. Um, I don't know if we have time. I guess let's let's definitely answer that final quiz, which was a quiz question, which was in which country are abortion pills the most restricted from over-the-counter pharmacy and online consumer purchase? You can probably guess by now, the answer is B, the United States. So um, all those other countries in one way or the other have more uh, access. They have more ability, whether it's that um, public health workers can, or um, uh, doulas or medical assistants can, ac can access the pills. There's different circumstances, but at the end of the day, if you add it all up, the US is still the most restricted. And it's time for that to change. Amy, thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you. Just giving the fast track of everything that's yeah, going so on. Um, I'm about to hand it over to Zach. Just a little note, we will be sending all those resources and links to the petition and the calls to action in the email that you will get um, following <laughs> this webinar. Um, and so keep that in the back of your mind. Please keep dropping those questions in the Q&A. And I mean, Zach, I'm about to hand it over to you. Can you continue to tell us about how these harms done by overregulations are impacting people, not just during COVID, um, but how those are being highlighted by COVID and um, how these problems were here far, far, far before then as well? Yeah, sure. So, um, so uh, thank you all for all attending and for having uh, NAMA Recovery to be a part of this uh, webinar. Um, and Many f folks that uh, I know or that are members of NAMA at first glance when they saw this webinar advertised uh, didn't make the immediate connection between medications for opioid use disorder and medications for self-managed uh, abortion and reproductive freedom. And uh, But the parallels are great. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about that. And um, uh, often it's the same. Uh, we have a lot of overlap in populations that need reproductive health care. Uh, that also uh, need access to evidence-based treatment for substance use disorder. 
Um, and both medications uh, in both camps are overly stigmatized, overly regulated, um, often unavailable and difficult to access. And so I think it's really neat uh, that the NAPW uh, had the thought to bring these things together because uh, we often advocate for the same individuals and for autonomy and liberty, um, but too often uh, don't don't overlap the way we should. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen, which I'm going to do right now, maybe. Here it is. So I trust that you all can see my screen. Um, and so what I wanted to start with real quick is you all hear on the news, the opioid epidemic in the United States. I'm not gonna throw a ton of numbers at you. But just to kind of give you the severity, the, the, the depth of this, this data, as you can see from the bottom, this is the most recent data we have. It takes a couple of years uh, before the data is compiled and released. So by all accounts, the numbers you're looking at here today are much greater. Um, and so you can see that, you know, we have 2.1 million people, for example, diagnosed with an opioid use disorder. And we know that only a very tiny fraction of individuals who are diagnosed actually, um, a tiny fraction of people with a disorder actually end up with a diagnosis. And so this just kind of shows you the breadth uh, and how widespread this issue is. And I'm actually going to pause because I didn't do my poll, um, Kendall. So uh, before I go much further, um, I gave you a hint on one of them already, but uh, can we throw up that poll, Kendall? Uh, so I can get those answers before I keep on going. There we go. So there's three questions here you should see. Go ahead and uh, take time to do your best. Again, no right or wrong. We're not calling anybody out. Um, but just to see if you know kind of a measure of where folks are. And I'm not seeing stuff come in, Kendall, so I'll let you let us know when it's, we've had enough time. Sure thing. We've got about 20% of people I've submitted. Oh, it's popping up. About five more seconds. And I think I could even share the results. Do you want me to share the results? Oh, cool. Yeah, share them. Good. So, very good. Perfect. Um, yeah, medication. So the, on number one, it is medication assisted treatment. Although I don't know that medication for addiction treatment would be incorrect because that is <laughs> what it is. Uh, but officially, when you see MAT uh, from the federal authorities and others, uh, the official translation is medication assisted treatment. You also may now see MOUD. That's a new common medications for opioid use disorder. Um, so this one is um number two the uh, technically they're all right considering the plus sign that's after them all but the closest uh, right answer is uh, 100 and, uh 130 135 uh, of individuals die from an overdose um every day and we know again that's the most recent data that we have but we know that that's much larger um today than it was since we've been able to compile the data we are hoping that uh, very soon, we're going to have uh, 2018 data. And which medication is not approved? So there are three meds uh, that are approved by the FDA for opioid use disorder. And those are buprenorphine or brand name Suboxone, Subutex, Zubsolve. There's a variety of brand names there. Methadone is approved and naltrexone is approved. Interestingly, although I'm not going to go into it, naltrexone is the only medication that's approved for both opioid use disorder as well as alcohol use disorder. Uh, so that's actually approved because they have similar neuropathways. So a camprosate is not approved. That's actually, it is an FDA approved medicine, but only for alcohol use disorder. So the three uh, are methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. Methadone and buprenorphine being the two that are the most regulated and the most stigmatized. Okay, so let's see. I think we can close out of that now. So good, so there's some base knowledge. Um, so again, we're talking about millions of Americans um, and we have a lot of individuals that may die of opioid related overdose that are never characterized as such. And so as with all numbers, we know that the reality 
it's often much larger. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how I can advance. There we go. So what if I told everybody in the midst of those numbers and the nightly news and seeing uh, the overdose death rates, I told everyone that we had a solution that could result in the reduction in the use of illicit substances and criminal activity, reduction in needle sharing, reduction of HIV infection rates and transmission, including and hepatitis C as well. Uh, it's cost effective. It's not, not that expensive as long as the bureaucracy doesn't make it so. A reduction in com the need for, um, we should say, um, a commercial sex work for people that uh, would otherwise not prefer to engage in that work. Reduction in the number of reports of multiple sex partners, improvements in social health and productivity overall, improvement in overall health conditions, uh, also a reduction in suicide and reduction in lethal overdose. And if we just look at data and we had a solution that could give us these things, you know, most individuals I would think would say, well, that's what we need. That's what can help us solve the opioid crisis. And the reality is that we do um, have this. And so when it's part of a comprehensive treatment program, and by comprehensive, we mean that we also link the individual, the service recipient, not only to a medication, but to other services they may need to help them have a more quality life or help them be more autonomous and independent be that counseling, peer recovery specialist, basic resources, housing, and whatever the individual's need is, because um, depending on socioeconomic status, as with um, uh, access to abortion pills and, and or surgical abortion for that matter, um, it can vary based on uh, socioeconomic status and to just how accessible it can be. Um, but when it's part of a comprehensive treatment program, medication-assisted treatment, specifically with methadone and buprenorphine, are effective treatments for heroin and prescription opioid use disorder when measured by all these things. I threw a couple of sources up, but guys, this has been um, proven time and time uh, again. Other than perhaps statins, methadone in particular for opioid use disorder is one of the most evidence-based treatments in all of medicine in terms of the number of peer review journals and studies and research uh, that's proven its effectiveness. Um, and so that's really what we're talking about. And so, and despite overwhelming evidence, just like the safety and the evidence in the abortion pill and the abortion medications for self-managed abortions, we are hit with unreasonable regulatory um, red tape uh, that prevents individuals from seeking treatment or from being able to access it. And so it's interesting as Amy was talking about how in the United States only abor abortion pills can only be accessed in clinics. You can't get them in pharmacies and, and things. Um, we have a parallel there too. Methadone, um, specifically methadone and buprenorphine um, are only available either in specialty clinics, um, methadone only available in specialty clinics and buprenorphine um, is only available either in those same specialty clinics or from a physician that has a special training and gets a special DEA registration to prescribe um, buprenorphine. And so even though we have mounds of evidence um, and that methadone in other countries has been proven that it can be effectively and safely delivered in multiple models, we're stuck with one model in the United States. That said, the abortion pill can be managed safely at home. Uh, methadone in the induction, the early stages, um, is not quite so safe for, for self-administration until a patient is stabilized on their appropriate dosage. And then um, it's a very safe medication for people that are methadone tolerant. And so some of those safety issues do warrant methadone in particular to be started in a specialty program. But after someone is stabilized and doing well, the red tape continues where in the beginning, a lot of people don't realize if you enroll in medication assisted treatment, you have to go to the clinic every day. It's not that you just have to go to get it one time or once a month, you're going every day. And we force patients to continue that even after they're stable based on arbitrary time frames that some regulator decided in the, the 70s. Um, and so, 
and op opioid treatment programs or OTPs are the name of these specialty clinics and they are much more common than abortion clinics. Um, we have nationwide, there's over 1,600 OTPs. And so even though they're much more um, widespread and available than um, abortion clinics are, we still have many areas where they, uh, people have to drive long distances. And if we're talking going every day. And so, you know, what is the, how do we balance the safety issues with uh, access and, and the whole risk versus benefit analysis. And so that's there uh, with these. And a lot of those overly burdensome regulations that don't make sense in terms of patient safety or access are there because of stigma. And that's a lot, uh, and that's another parallel that we have between access to uh, medications for a safe, self-managed abortion and, and access to medications to treat an opioid use disorder. This is a quote from the World Health Organization about stigma in general, and it says it's, uh, about substance use stigma, but you could easily uh, parallel this to what we were talking about earlier. The stigma associated with substance use and dependence can prevent individuals from seeking treatment and can prevent adequate policies regarding prevention and treatment from being implemented. And so I don't think that we can not consider the impact of societal stigma, be it on access to abortion services as essential medical services or access to medications to treat substance use disorders as essential medical services. That stigma against substance use, against uh, reproductive freedom in our country also impacts on the people that need those services and that seek those services. And so it can prevent people who otherwise would make the decision that it's in their best interest to seek these services. Uh, that stigma can prevent them from ever making that choice. But then also our policies, just like not being able to get uh, the Plan C medications in pharmacies or over-the-counter um, in our country when it is the norm in other countries. And so we can't discount stigma, but a lot of this just doesn't make sense. When we're talking about evidence and science and and what the objective facts are um, and so stigma impacts that and then particularly this gentleman's name is Dr. Herman Joseph he was one of the original researchers um, that uh, worked alongside the doctors that developed and got methadone approved for opioid use disorder back in the the late 60s early 70s named Dr. Herman Joseph who passed away last year um, and he said specifically about methadone, which remains the most proven effective medication for opioid use disorder, that no other medication in the history of modern medicine has been so unjustly maligned. Maybe Plan C, though. Or, you know, maybe he wasn't thinking about that. Um, but the stigma that methadone patients feel is a real phenomenon. And in comparison with other social stigmas, appears to be entrenched in the collective social consciousness of the country at every level of society. That if you just think about that, the, the level of stigma that is entrenched in the collective social consciousness of the country. And I think that uh, we can easily parlay that to Plan C medications, but that these, these essential medications for someone that has an opioid use disorder to live a quality life, to improve their health and wellness, to live a self-directed life, um, are hindered mostly by stigma. And I don't think uh, we, as advocates, we certainly can't not consider how that stigma impacts on the individual in need's own view of themselves if they receive services. Many individuals I know that have come into methadone or buprenorphine programs, come in with uh, feeling bad about their decision. They come in saying, well, I couldn't do it on my own, so I'm going to have to get on methadone. Instead of celebrating, they've made the decision to seek what the CDC says is the most effective treatment for their disease. And, you know, so how many um, women who seek re uh, abortion services, be they um, chemical or surgical, come in with that same sense of guilt for making a decision that they've deemed is in the best interest of living a self-directed life and improving their health and wellness and, 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 and all of those things. 
And so there's one reflection that I want to to go on because it's not often um, that um, these worlds collide, like I talked about earlier, but uh, I really appreciate it because when I was an undergraduate uh, student in college a few few years ago, <laughs> um, I was, uh, I had, I would say the privilege, the eye-opening experience, but uh, an immense privilege to one of the volunteer things that I did um, was I was a, a clinic escort um, at a reproductive clinic. Um, and just the, the, the women that I would be able to give safe passage to the program to encourage them as they came to the program, this was in the South, if you all couldn't tell by my accent, I'm Southern. <laughs> and um, it was especially nasty. Some days I remember um, I was telling Kendall and Amy before we had these huge like football style umbrellas that you could fit a whole family of eight under, you know, um, and some days it was so bad that we would have those and sort of hold them sideways to shield the women that came to the clinic. And you think about um, we've also seen that that NIMBY, if you've ever heard that acronym, not in my backyard, NIMBY, and we see it with abortion clinics. And we likewise see it with substance use disorder treatment clinics that provide methadone and buprenorphine treatment. And that um, so many towns try to keep both types of clinics out through zoning ordinances or the, the community getting riled up. If they are able to make it to being able to open, usually through court battles, um, the protests that ensue and um, we've seen it on the substance use disorder treatment side, just as we've seen it on the side of women's health clinics. And so I think that it's, uh, the parallels are interesting here, but they're, they're, they go uh, hand in hand, that it's really rooted in stigma and um, social control, that we have uh, people, certain politicians that want to control other people's behaviors and bodies, even what medications they can take. Um, and so that social control combined with the stigma that's developed on these issues has really made it difficult uh, for people to access these um, essential services. And I think that's critical. These both um, Plan C as well as methadone and buprenorphine for opioid use disorder, those are essential medical services um, that oftentimes, many times, uh, literally, um, for some people, can be life and death access to some of these services. Um, and so I would, uh, I'm going to wrap up with that because I don't know, I probably, I forgot to start my timer. I've probably already gone over my 15 minutes. Um, but um, I, again, I have the pleasure of, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I want to leave time to make sure that we, um, either Amy or myself, get to address any questions, uh, Q&A that's come in. Thank you so much, Zach. And we do have a number of questions. I mean, it really, it, thank you so much for drawing all those parallels while talking. And it's so interesting just to really sit there and think that there are a lot of politicians that are thinking, I don't like, and not just to the people that you're working with, Zach, but Amy, you as well, I don't like what you're doing with your life. So I know you need this medication. So I'm going to make you come and get it. I'm going to make you, I can't stop you from having this medication outright. So I'm going to make you physically come to me to come to a um a, a clinic uh to to get it and so i think that was one question that we had um was for zach uh can you talk a little bit about how far some people have to drive and travel each day to get their daily dose of methadone amy i know that you'd mentioned that some people have to drive 600 plus miles across state lines zach what do people have to do literally every day not like people are doing this every day this one person's doing this every day I, uh, one patient comes to my mind when um, I had a program that I ran in Chatsworth, Georgia. It's a small town, but it's just across the Tennessee border in North Georgia. And um, we had a patient that drove from, uh, it was a, almost four hours, one way, one way uh, to come to the program. And she did that. So she would stay in hotels several days. Sometimes she made the trip back. Um, she had the resources the car that could make that drive, the resources to stay in a hotel and be able to pay for treatment because at that time, few insurances covered these services. Um, that's starting to get better on our, on the addiction treatment side. We're still fighting that battle on reproductive freedom. Um, but, you know, so that's an extreme example, but it's often, it's 
it's very common for individuals to drive in anywhere from an hour uh, or more each direction in some communities to receive these services. And so uh, there are more opioid treatment programs than there are abortion clinics. Um, but there are plenty of areas where people have to drive long distances. And even if the doctor, the clinic is right down the street, I want everyone to think about if you take any medications that you've ever taken, even if it's just antibiotics, for those 10 days you had to go to the doctor, even if it was in your community, to take that pill. Um, and in the very beginning of methadone treatment, there's actually some safety reasons why we would, but every other day would likely be fine, but just for a couple of weeks, but we make them do it for months and months. And uh, under the federal guidelines, you have to be in treatment for two years before you could get to monthly attendance. And some states like North Carolina, uh, I saw a North Carolina provider pop on the list of attendees, I won't call her out, but um, you know, it's four years to get to just to once a month. And you think, you know, for a lot of other meds, people are fighting to just go every 90 days, you know, uh, or, or just get refilled. And so uh, it's, it's not as inaccessible as reproductive um, as women's health clinics are, but we're talking about daily ongoing long-term treatment for a chronic disease because opioid use disorder treatment is not an acute treatment, it's chronic and ongoing. And that also does not really work during a pandemic when people are being told, hey, for your health and for everyone's health, we need you to shelter your place. And uh, the other side of their mouth are saying, and we also need you to come in every day and be in this room with all these people. And it, that's, I, I remember looking at your social media and seeing that there was a lot of calls to action of, of saying like, this is not okay. And that this really needs yeah. to be addressed. Thank you so much, Zach. Uh, Amy, we have a, a question with lots of thumbs up for you. Um, it is, do you have to be 18 to order Plan C? Does it require parental approval or is it possible to remain completely anonymous through the process of ordering, paying for, and receiving Plan C? Great question. Um, first, I want to again clarify, I love that uh, people are using the brand name Plan C as the term and we do that too. We talk about abortion pills as Plan C. Um, just to clarify again, we don't actually ship provide, sell pills or services. Um, but the, the answer to that is that it all varies state by state. You know, we are living in this country where there are federal rules and then there are state by state and it just all depends. And um, that's why these organizations exist like uh, If When How, which is a nonprofit based out of Berkeley that is helping people navigate. They have a reproductive justice hotline, uh, repro hotline, where if you have any questions about the state you're in, you can call and get more information specific to your situation. Um, and um, yeah, so it, it, it just depends. But the idea would be that anyone who needs this support um, would get it and that they would get support uh, in a respectful, non-stigmatized, and appropriate way based on their situation. Thanks so much, Amy. Stigma yeah. really does seem to be kind of the word that it keeps revolving around. Yeah. Um, wondering how do they reach out to the If When How hotline? Is that a specific number or a website? It's both. Yep, I will um, make sure that it's included in the follow-up. It's, um, I think it's Repro Legal Hotline. Or maybe you can um, just drop it in the chat if you can find it. Yeah, I'll drop it in the chat. Yeah. So that's an organization that's specifically set up to address individuals who are scared of being prosecuted. Um, basically set up to ensure that no individual is prosecuted for providing for their own care. That's their mission. Which is something that we at NAPW are very familiar with people being criminalized for the outcome of their pregnancy or having the capacity for pregnancy. So I think mm. our ED says being pregnant and, and so the crime of being pregnant and using drugs, the crime of being pregnant mm. and um, ending your pregnancy. Uh, right. so thank you for sharing that resource. And Zach, I have another question for you. Uh, this is from an anonymous uh, attendee. Why do you think the opioid crisis is so severe in the US specifically what are the mistakes we are making in approaching it? You know, those tiny questions. 
So that's an entire webinar of its own, a three-hour one probably. But um, So there's a lot of reasons that we're in the opioid crisis uh, that we're currently um, in. Um, and a high-level view is sort of a perfect storm between um, big pharma greed and manipulation um, combined with uh, there's just a lot of stuff, regulations, and it was, again, it was sort of a perfect storm. And then what happened is as the um, well-meaning attempts to cut down on the unethical prescribing of prescription opioids came through and they cut people off without providing any access to, I don't know, methadone or buprenorphine, for example, um, then we ushered in a heroin epidemic um, because heroin acts on the same receptors. It's diacetylmorphine is, the, is heroin. Um, it's patented by the Bayer Aspirin Company. A lot of people don't know that in the early 1900s. And, um, and so now we can't even track where it's coming from. So as we've seen prescription opioid um, use decline or at least plateau in some areas, now we've seen the rise of heroin. And so it's a lot of missteps on the public policy. Um, and there's, there's a whole lot to how we got here in the United States. Um, and Canada has a similar opioid crisis parallel to ours. The mistakes that we're making in addressing it, I think, though, are just not having enough focus on access to evidence-based treatment. Um, we still hear about these traditional rehabs where you know lock somebody up for 30 days, 90 days, um, which uh, can be an effective approach for some substance use disorders, but people with an opioid use disorder, over 90% relapse, over nine. So we're talking less than 10% success rate, whereas with MAT, with medication, with methadone or buprenorphine specifically, those two of the three, um, those relapse rates go from 90% down to around 20%. And so while we're not starting with the one with a 70% success rate and still focusing on throwing money at the one with a 10% success rate is a failure of drug policy and prioritizing evidence and science um, in our approach in this country. Um, thank goodness for the private sector um, and because now 60% of OTPs are proprietary, owned by proprietary companies. Um, that brings with it its pros and cons, right? Because when profit rules um, or profit-driven companies oversee healthcare, and that's not unique to opioid treatment, it's a symptom of our overall healthcare system in this country. Um, that presents its own challenges and potential priorities that may not always be the best interest of, of, of treatment. And so there's a lot of things at play, but why are we not seeing public clinics being opened? Um, even Nixon, President Nixon, for all of his <laughs> fault, when the Vietnam uh, veterans were returning with opioid use disorder, um, he opened many federally funded methadone programs that in subsequent years have been closed. And so states, counties, the federal government, they're not, um, prioritizing or pushing or incentivizing the opening of more opioid treatment programs. Um, and that's really, you know, we have the solution. We've seen the data. I gave you just a little snippet of it tonight, but that's not um, being prioritized. The Support Act that was recently passed did allow, it does force, essentially force um, now all 50 state Medicaid plans to cover all three medicines. So that'll help some, but the vast majority of people in the country aren't on Medicaid. Um, and if commercial policies still aren't covering it, a lot of people work and they may have insurance, but if it's, you know, enough to pay their bills, um, but may not have enough money to pay for treatment out of pocket. So it's a policy failure is, is the high view that we're not prioritizing evidence and science. We're allowing that stigma, again, like the World Health Organization talked about, to drive our approach. Thank you, Zach. And I know we have another question. Um, for Amy that also talks about affordability. But before I get to that one, I do know we are coming up on our time and I wanna make sure I get you out on time. It's 7.57. So I have one question that's joint for, for Amy and Zach, but before I ask that uh, question, Zach, I wanted to know if you wanted to give a plug uh, for the Google form that's gonna be going out and the email that will come after the webinar, letting people know how they can get more involved um, if they wanna be sure. Yeah. Yeah, so if, if anyone that wants to get involved in any 
level. A little bit, a lot, just observe, just get the emails. Um, they're going to be sending out a Google form. Um, just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a real simple form, but that way, um, as we continue to organize our advocacy efforts with NAMA Recovery and the various partners we've had, we've partnered with the NAPW on many things over the years, especially around pregnant or parenting women um, with substance use disorders that need access to MAT or are being discriminated against. Any way you want to get involved, um, the more advocates, the better. So please fill out the form. Um, no pressure. We won't spam you. It'll just be an occasional email. Uh, but that way we know people that are interested. Um, and I do have to drop right at eight. So if I disappear, because uh, we have another advocacy call, um, again, I appreciate uh, the invitation this evening. So that quickest of questions is, Zach and Amy, can you discuss the, similar, the similarities you might see in the advocacy strategies you use? I mean, my first thought is that it does start with destigmatizing. It starts with normalizing, with, with making peace with these things that we've put into, you know, under a label of bad or shameful or whatever. It's like, forget that. Treat everyone as yeah. a human being and move forward with strategies that actually address what they need. And be creative and entrepreneurial and work with partners and it's all here for us you know that's the that's the thing that we get fired up about at plan c is it's like we're living in a perfect moment to solve this we have the internet we have commerce we're so comfortable with ordering things online and getting them delivered we're so comfortable with these systems that are for better or worse instant and you know available and always in our radar and so the moment we can take these out of the camp of these things that are you know problem or whatever and put them over on the side of let's solve them like startups solve problems let's solve them like yeah. like even parts of our you know <laughs> broken healthcare system is trying to solve things then we'll start to move forward yeah, i endorse i mean i agree it's it's about stigma uh starting to deal with in real ways stigma recognizing it even for those of us that are advocates recognizing when it creeps up in our in our minds or in our approach to things because we're not immune from mm. that social entrenchment of stigma but and then other than that what follow evidence and science yeah. i mean you know what does the science say what does the evidence yeah. say and i think on yeah. both of these issues i think there's a parallel there um what's safe what's in someone's best interest what are what's the reality um, I don't, you know, and get out of our emotions and, and really think, you know, right. and just treat each other with respect. Uh, yeah. You don't know what I've I'll been like through. That. I don't know what you've been through, you know. Mm -hmm. so. And if we need to look outside of our country, look at other countries and what's working. You That's know, fine. We're in such yeah. a bubble. And yet there's places all yeah. around the world that are doing this successfully in, in both models and in so many On ways. both sides. Yeah. On, our, on the MAT side as well. You know, yeah. that's, that's a great, another great parallel. Yeah. So, um, I have to draw. Thank you all. Um, Thank you so much, Zach. So much. All right. I'll Thanks, everybody. Here. And you're feel free. I will pop my email if someone wants to contact NAMA. The Google form's coming, but I'm going to put my NAMA email in the chat box before I drop. If anyone has any additional questions, or as I know a lot of you all are law students, as you go out and you have. Uh, you want to get involved. We'd love some good legal warriors on the MAT side for sure. All right, guys. Have a good evening. Thanks so much, Zach. So we're almost done. We have um, a number of questions uh, that we could still pose to Amy, and so I want to make sure those get answered. Amy, do you have some time to stay on the line? I do. So we understand if you have to hop off um, all of our attendees, but Amy, thank you so much for staying and answering some questions. Um, I'm also, if people are about to hop off, I just do want to do a little pitch, our kind of our calls to action. Uh, that we have. If you want to be a MAT advocate, please fill out that Google form that will be coming in that follow-up email. I'll be sending out um, the Plan C resources that are going to be there, the toolkit. Amy, I know you can talk a little bit more about that. Um, I also want to put up a little poll um, right here that if you want to get more involved with the National Advocates for Pregnant Women, if you're interested in helping us spread the word about the student series that you're watching right now, if you want to become a student organizer, please click yes and we can see whose email clicked yes and we can reach out to you and tell you more about that. But I'm going to leave that up here while we answer some more questions. So um, we've got a great question from Maya. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. 
Yeah, I think we were going to say the same one about pricing. Is that? Yeah. Oh, the pricing one. Yes, let's do that one first. Great idea. Okay. Um, how can we make sure abortion pills are not only available, but affordable? Even if they become more widely available, will insurance cover them? Great question. Um, I did mention a price point before, and so I'm really glad that we're talking about this to balance out what I referenced before, which is that $600 to $800 range in clinics. And um, what we're finding online already with these online pharmacies and with aid access is, um, so aid access is $95 sliding scale, which is pretty incredible. So when a woman, come, a person comes through that system, um, they are, uh, they, they pay $95 and that includes the medication, abortion, the shipping, everything. And um, that organization is not making money, actually. They're just covering costs. And um, the online pharmacies are a little higher. They are businesses. And so they are charging anywhere from 150 to 350 um, per package. But already you can see that is more manageable. And this is, again, for people who are self-managing and they're going online to find what they're looking for. Um, we believe that absolutely, as, as we move past these restrictions, as we get into more of a, you know, again, this, this um, getting rid of these old ideas of how this particular situation has to operate and treating it more like any kind of service to people, it's, it's absolutely possible to have this be affordable. You know, the, as I, I did mention, the cost of the pills themselves, $6, $7 over the counter. So. Um, if you're a you know, business student, if you see how this works, um, people can still build uh, businesses and the medical, you know, the, the systems that exist to um, get this type of solution out to people can absolutely price it fairly and also sustain that system. So we're hopeful, you know, things before that, that it could be at a price point like 150 to 250. Um, and then insurance is just case by case. Unfortunately, our system is so fragmented that whether or not abortion is covered is extremely case by case. It has to do with where you live. It has to do with the insurance company, Medi-Cal, et cetera, Medicare. So, um, uh, not Medicare, sorry, Medi-Cal. But yes, that's the short answer there about price. Amy, can you remind me, is there a place that I can see this information, maybe like beautifully formatted, laid out, like some kind of report card where I can really see <laughs> the price breakdowns and maybe how these different sites are, are regulated or are, are valued in advocacy organizations? <laughs> Funny, you should ask. We <laughs> have just the thing. We, in 2017, in partnership with an organization called Genuity, we did a research study on what's out there, um, and we called it a report card, and we put it online. And um, at the time, what we were navigating was a lot of questions and concern on is that legal? Is what is? Can you do that? Can you share that kind of information? You know, and we said we are researchers. We are, um, you know, people who research and write about things, and we are sharing information under our First Amendment right. And so, um, that has become a huge tool. It's visited by, I think, anyone where from ten thousand to twenty thousand people a month. Our, web, our website gets about 30,000 visits a month. Most people go to the report card. Most people go to the page called Me Pills to try to understand the landscape. So that tells us right there what people are coming to our website for, obviously. Um, and then the, the other information and tools that are on our site are all around. If you're not pregnant, if you, if you don't need abortion pills, but you just learned about this situation you want to get involved, then here's what you need. Fantastic. And then... Maya, I did want to get to your question because it does talk about the COVID-19. So given right. the COVID-19 pandemic, and we talked a little bit about this, um, has exposed deep inequalities in the U.S. healthcare system, as Amy mentioned. Do you foresee an increase in access to at-home abortion pills and medications in general after the pandemic is over? If not, how will the pandemic change medical protocols for better or for worse? Yep, uh, great question. Again, this, this is already showing us so much um we are already seeing so okay we're seeing a few things we're already seeing uh, providers and medical organizations start to change what they believe to be the necessary protocol so we are already seeing there's a there's actually a published or a um a draft of a new protocol so there is this draft of a new no test protocol 
that involves a new model of care that we don't see any reason why it would go back to an old way after this. Um, it, 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 we are def definitely operating under extreme times. You know, the lockdown orders are making it, um, it, people are making decisions based on a very specific set of circumstances. And so um, as things change, then people might go back to seeking out services in person and you know, in clinics just like they would. But we see, um, first of all, we did, we did see an increase in traffic to our website. So we did see people going online to search out what are my options in this time of pandemic. We are seeing that a lot of the online sources are sold out or low supply. So that means that people are actually doing this or, you know, trying to do this. And um, those, those suppliers are running out. And um, for, in terms of the end of that question, I think that it's, I think the pandemic is going to change protocol for the better. I think it's, again, it's, it's not only revealing the inequities and the flaws in our system, but it's also revealing what we need and do not need for this particular scenario, which, you know, it has changed like things do. You know, we, we came out the gate 20 years ago, even besides having these restrictions, um, providers thought that they needed an ultrasound and blood tests in order to feel good about this, about abortion pills. And it turns out after decades and so much research and so much observing of the people who are pregnant, the women who are choosing this, um, they really accurately date their pregnancies and there isn't actually a risk. There isn't actually a higher statistical risk to um, using abortion pills without those in-person protocols. So. Again, we, we feel like this is something that we've been talking about for years and the pandemic has pushed us into a moment where we're forced to consider other options as a society where, we're, where, where we must consider what does this mean to, um, you know, make sure someone gets pills at home on their own, a self-managed abortion, like here we are, this is what um, our reality requires of us and the medical community is absolutely stepping up and and considering it right alongside of an organization like ours because the data again you know to our point that we just referenced the data is there it's all um it's it's proven it's solid it's not just a hope and a prayer it's like this is real and it's been real for so many other countries for so many years and now because of our circumstances here in the states we're changing the way that we see the opportunity for self-managed care. And just to, to bring it home one more time, that question, like in its simplest form, can you, uh, currently, can you have Plan C or self-manage abortions in any state? What would be your, your answer? That is a common, I mean, that, that is the question, right? So what? again, I would, I would point us back to our um, constitutional protections to bodily autonomy yeah. and right alongside of that in um, almost, you know, I would just say kind of a personal observation almost existing in contradiction is the fact that these states are state by state deciding what they think um, is acceptable. And um, so can you do it? Good question. Um, we've seen people doing it. We've seen them choosing it, going online, ordering it, um, you know, it's happening, I guess I would say, and the internet is unstoppable. And so we never, we're never recommending, we're never, um, you know, pressuring. We're, we are simply a platform for information. And um, as someone makes this decision, they have to understand their legal risk, uh, depending what state they sit in. So that would be my other answer to that question is, um, every person has a right to their own body and to make choices around their own body under their constitutional protections, and um, every person should consider what state they, they sit in and understand the restrictions on abortion in that state so that they can make a decision for themselves, because that's how people make decisions, right? Um, that's, I know it's not a crystal clear answer, but the, we're not living in crystal clear times, um, so we just have to keep coming back to the idea that no one should be prosecuted for self-managing abortion. No one should be prosecuted for choosing their own health care. I think that is a great place for us to stop. Amy, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you all so much for submitting these fantastic questions. And again, Amy, thanks for staying on and answering even more of them. 
I will so leave the poll is up if you want to get more involved with NAPW. And again, the petition that Amy was talking about is going to be coming in your inbox, as is all, uh, all these resources, as well as uh, the toolkit so that you can become an advocate on these issues. Because again, it's all about bringing together all these different um, these issues into one bigger movement so that we can really get some good work done. Uh, thank you all so much for sticking with us. We is, it is past time, so we're going to head out. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Have a good night, thank everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kendall. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.